Our topic for today is asteroids. Not just mining them, but the vital role they could play in spreading ourselves out around the solar system. Now, chances are, you have already heard or read about the idea of mining asteroids. I've noticed that there is a lot of talk about the idea, but as is often the case, not much beyond surface details. One is left with the impression that asteroids are rocks in space with metal in them, presumably some of it quite valuable like platinum or gold, and that we would like to have those precious metals brought home to Earth. So far so good. But while platinum and gold are quite valuable, and useful too, not only does much of that value come from scarcity, which means hauling back megatons of the stuff would not be nearly as profitable as it sounds like, but it occasionally occurs to people that Earth, outmassing every asteroid in the solar system combined, actually has considerably more of these metals than they do. Indeed, before we finish today, we will pretty much kill the fictional notion that anyone will be exporting iron or bulky metals back to Earth, even while we see how incredibly useful mining these things will be. And to do that, we might as well begin with what an asteroid is, because it is often misunderstood and vague. Asteroid is a loose term, and not a great one either since it means star-like, which they certainly are not. The first one we discovered, back in 1801, Ceres, is generally not even considered an asteroid anymore, but a dwarf planet like Pluto, making it dwarf planet number one or planet number five, between Mars and Jupiter, depending on how you view Pluto. It is about four times more massive than the next most massive asteroid, Vesta, and mass is about half of what the rest of the asteroid belt combined mass is, which number tens of millions of objects many thousands of which could do double duty as mountains or kill off the dinosaurs. So Ceres and the other famous asteroids are not particularly representative of what we mean when we talk about asteroids, and when it comes to mining them, it is actually the small ones that interest us more than the big ones. And it is not just about size. Asteroid composition is anything but monolithic, as it were, but loosely falls into three categories. C, M, and S types. Those are easy to remember since they are short for carbon, metal, and silicate or stony. C type, carbon rich asteroids, are the most common, making up 75% of asteroids, while S type, silicate or stony asteroids, come in at a distant second at 17%. M type metallic asteroids are much less numerous. Now, when it comes to mining, that hardly tells the whole story. M types are mostly nickel and iron, neither of which we particularly want to bring home to Earth, but which would be valuable for building stuff in space. For that matter, there are also several subtypes of asteroids and two different classification systems, and the asteroid belt is anything but the only place you can find asteroids, nor the nearest place to find them. It is also not unusual for two asteroids of different types to blunder into each other and merge or to be somewhere in between these types. C-types, the most common asteroids, and also the ones that get ignored a lot in asteroid mining conversations focused on impressing folks with the idea of mountains of gold, are quite valuable themselves. They contain lots of water, which is never a bad thing to find in outer space. But they also contain plenty of life-useful elements, and particularly noteworthy is phosphorus, something that is quite hard to find on Earth in concentration, and a major bottleneck on agriculture. So if asteroid mining ever gets heavily developed and cheap, that is the sort of thing we might bring home since it is valuable. Not as valuable as gold or platinum, of course, nowhere near, and these big space boulders have a lot of those. We'd estimate that the usual S-type asteroid, not even the less common metallic M-types, are full of tons of metal, many valuable. One as big as your house would be expected to contain hundreds of tons of metal, and about your weight in gold and other precious metals. It is worth remembering that back when Earth formed as a big ball of molten rock, most of the metals sank to the core. This did not happen with these small asteroids, of course, and it would not matter if it did since most asteroids are not big and are incredibly easy to mine, at least if you ignore them being millions of miles away in the radiation-blasted airless void of space, which I think we would have to classify as a bit of an inconvenience. 
Still, your average asteroid is a loosely held together ball of gravel, and even the big ones have such low gravity you could bench press a truck on them. Generally speaking, those house-sized asteroids have such low gravity that if two of them were touching, you could squeeze in between them and shove them apart. Of course, the odds of two touching, or even near each other, is quite small. Even in the asteroid belt, which is quite dense with them, the distance between any two asteroids is large. Unlike the fictional representation, where asteroids are shown maybe a few hundred feet apart, the ones in the belt tend to be a few hundred miles apart, and a lot more if we're only considering asteroids bigger than a mile across. There may be around half a million of them, but the belt is so large that the spacing would be more like a million miles between them. If we are talking smaller objects, that amount would drop a lot, but we would not be mining small borders. You don't need to ram into something the size of a house though, honestly even a fist-sized chunk of rock can mess up your whole day if you blunder into it at thousands of miles per hour. But there's not much of a reason to go that fast when meandering around the belt to visit the nearest other big asteroid. So asteroid miners in a well-developed belt, should it become a major industry, carrying ore from wherever they've been prospecting back to some central base, might just cruise around at subsonic speeds where anything they cannot see and dodge would just bounce off a well-armored hull. We tend to think of all collisions in space as fatal and radiation as dangerous, but that is mostly because our modern ships are built tissue paper thin to save mass, or we are thinking of ships as plowing around full speed ahead. But in many cases, a ship would be better off saving fuel at a nice slow pace and going for thick armor. Potentially temporary armor just made of its freight. You might strap your mineral wealth to the outside of your ship, so it takes the collisions instead. You could glue cargo to your ship with ice for instance. If we saw a big buildup of belt mining operations, you would be likely to see spheres of operation near some decently large C-type asteroids where food and fuel could be made, and without gravity playing much of a role, large ships could burn around that region quite easily. Indeed, once you are up in space, ships do not require much sophistication. An airtight metal can with some simple chemical rockets, or even pressurized gas, would get the job done. You do not need much Delta V, or fuel as a result, to cover a few thousand miles of empty space. A lot less than you would need to drive that distance on Earth, and you'd make the trip in less time. No gravity slowing you down, no air friction or drag doing the same. Of course, the asteroid belt is also not the only place that has asteroids, and most planets, including our own, have collections of them meandering about tagging along our orbital path. These are called Near-Earth Asteroids, and we've identified thousands of them, ranging from man-sized to 20 miles across. Now we also have a subtype of Near-Earth Asteroid called EROs, or Easily Recoverable Objects ones that would take very little fuel to bring home, or to bring bits of home, which is probably worth addressing. I have often heard it suggested we might tow asteroids back to Earth orbit. I have no idea why we would do that. We have got plenty of rock down here on Earth, and plenty more on the Moon, and way too much junk kicking around in our orbit already without adding more. Why send home a megaton asteroid, the super majority of which has no value down here, when you can extract what you want there and just send that home, saving a lot of fuel. You might also wonder if the cost of fuel, which is very expensive, eliminates asteroids as a good candidate for mineral extraction. And the answer is no. For one thing, it takes way less fuel to move a ton of matter from an asteroid to Earth than a ton of Earth to an asteroid. A ton of gold, in a literal sense, is worth about $40 million and is about the size of a basketball. A million bucks in gold weighs about 50 pounds. I always find it amusing when a chest of gold is described in fiction brimming with coins and big enough that you could probably squeeze a person into one. You would need a forklift to budge such a thing, and yes, even as expensive as getting a ton of matter into space is, it is still significantly less than the value of gold, and again, it is a lot cheaper to bring the stuff home. If your mining operations were running you, say, 20 million bucks a ton to get to that asteroid and you needed 100 tons of crew and equipment, 
that's a $2 billion operation on the fuel side. Call it double that, $4 billion, for the lesser amount of return fuel and all the equipment itself. You'd need to dig out an equal mass, about 100 tons, to break even. But what is actually entailed in such an operation? Let's say we wanted to set up shop on one about a mile across. We'd expect several thousand tons of precious metals in an S or M type asteroid on this scale, maybe a hundred thousand tons total. Hypothetically, several trillion bucks worth of precious metals. Of course you would not want to bring all that home at once, even if you could. That's how you crash markets. But something like that would need to be a long term operation. So more like a permanent base. The first few trips might be the small ones so you could bring them home and maybe dissect them in low orbit, but eventually you would want to settle in for some serious mining. But also some serious construction too, and some serious manpower. We need to keep in mind that Near Earth Asteroid does not mean it is actually Near Earth, just that it occasionally passes near us. So Belt or Near Earth, it does not behoove potential mining companies to go dragging these things back to Earth, just the refined metal, and even then, mostly just the precious ones. That does not make the other metals useless though. Quite to the contrary, in many cases once you have the industry in place, it might actually be cheaper to haul even common metals like steel back to Earth orbit for construction of things in orbit than to lift them up from the surface of Earth. Even though in one case you are going a couple hundred million miles, and in the other only a couple hundred miles. But in all probability, the moon would be a better source, and a bigger one, since it outmasses the entire asteroid belt by a factor of at least twenty-four. The true value of the asteroid belt is building away from Earth. The precious metals are just a cash crop, as it were, like tobacco or tea war in colonial days. You take the precious metals home to Earth, and keep everything else in space, probably pretty close to hand. These places are distant from Earth, and the mining is likely to be a time consuming process as you refine it all on the spot too, so these are likely to be bases that are designed for independent operation, or interdependent operation with neighbors, as more gets built up and each can develop its own cottage industries to specialize in something. The guys on Asteroid Alpha have extra hydroponics they use to make clothes, for instance, while the guys on Asteroid Beta can make microchips. Classic trade situation depending on scarcity and difficulty locally manufacturing something versus the hassle and time and fuel of importing it. Scarcity by the way, or a lack of it, is our topic for next week. Post-Scarcity Civilizations won last week's audience poll and the two biggest linchpins of that sort of civilization would probably be access to nuclear fusion and very elaborate 3D printing or even self-replicating nano machines. If you have got those, then the dynamic for mining changes, as you might not even need to send people to oversee this stuff. It takes some brains on site though. We could remote mine the moon, it is only two light seconds away, so smart automation is not an absolute necessity. But asteroids will be many minutes away in communications lag, so you need a brain on site, be it human or sophisticated machine, which we will be looking at more next next week in the video on technological singularities which came in second place in the poll. But we are talking about year long missions if not more, so being able to grow your own food and recycle your water and air are not absolute necessities, but they certainly would help. Especially since only for the smallest asteroids would you be likely to exhaust the thing's resources in a year. Everything you can make on spot, or repair on spot to cut down on spares, cuts down on your initial mass and total costs. We will assume someone is planning to set up shop there for the long term. Not necessarily as individuals, people might cycle back and forth every launch window, which is about once a year. Yes, launch windows to the asteroid belt come up more often than Mars. Mars is too close and fast for us to have a window very often. We get launch windows to Mars every 26 months. For things further out, we get one just a bit less often than once a year, every 15 months for Ceres, and that is about the norm for the asteroid belt. 
The further away, the more often they come. In most cases, you could not unload the ship arriving from Earth and reload it for immediate launch home, since the window home might be many months off. But for the belt, especially if you can get away with using a bit more than minimum thrust, in many cases you could pack up on that same ship after a fairly short stayover. We won't go into Homan transfers, beyond saying they are the ideal minimum fuel cost way of shipping things, so you might not use them for people but you probably would for cargo. Of course if you are just shipping home people and gold and platinum, fuel costs are not all that big a deal for your shiny cargo. We will get to profitability and legal issues in a moment. Let's say we spotted a nice merged asteroid, say a C-type and an S-type had crunched into each other at some point to give us the best of both worlds. And a lot of asteroids are a bit of a mix too, which is why there are so many subdivisions. Some big hulking mountain-sized thing several miles wide, of which there are thousands, would mass about 100 billion tons. We can comfortably estimate that that thing has at least a few million tons of precious metals in it with a market value of around a hundred trillion or more dollars. And again, we can expect to be sending cargo home a little over once a year and receiving new equipment and personnel on the same timetable. This means we do not need to manufacture anything small in mass that is hard to do like computer chips. But even stuff like solar panels would be better made on site, and indeed they do look well inside the realm of 3D printing, and the main component being silicon, an S-type or silicon type asteroid is going to have plenty on hand. If you have gotten nuclear fusion, and a mobile and portable version of it, great. That lets you ignore the need for launch windows probably too. But let's assume solar power only. What does our base need? We need power, so we need to bring solar panels with us to cover all basic needs and the ability to scale up on site, in situ. We need to refine the metal and power the equipment too, so we need a lot of power. We need to grow food, we need to stay safe from radiation and micrometeors, and we need gravity. We probably need it on the way there too because it is a long trip, longer than tomorrow's. This means you probably want your ship to spin to generate artificial gravity, something we have talked about tons of times before on this channel. But it also means you can just bury your full ship there with a hollow shell around it and cover that in rock, and now you have gravity and protection. Expanding on that by digging down further, or shaft mining at another site, would probably be a good idea too. Take all that iron that is useless for export, and turn it into small spinning habitats for your people and plants. We already talked about a long-term expansion of such a thing into a giant rotating habitat bigger than the original asteroid back in the rotating habitats video, but now we see the early stages and the motivation for expansion to one. There is tons of money to be made, and you just ship home the precious metals, probably to pay for things you cannot make there and for passage for your newcomers to get to your growing settlement. You use the other material to expand that settlement, to extract your air and water and fertilizers for plants, and make your homes and solar panels. I think if I were doing this, and I generally like to aim huge which biases me, I would start with Dunbar's number worth of people, generally thought to be about 150 to 160 people, and generally considered your good minimum size for a long-term isolated outpost. That means you can get away with a lot of support personnel and specialists. So talking profit, how much do they need to send home each year? First let me note that world gold production is a few thousand tons a year right now, at all-time historic highs, and the price has stayed quite high, so we can assume you could ship in a comparable amount at least before it would start screwing with the market too much, and we could safely assume if you were matching that level of production, you could expect a revenue of a hundred billion dollars a year. That is actually the kind of cash that would let us send hundred man crews off to these spots. It is also the sort of money that lets you start building the kinds of things we discussed in the early Megastructures episodes, like mass drivers and skyhooks, that are quite expensive to build but let you do launches much cheaper. We don't do these now because they cost a lot of money to build 
and only save you money if you are doing way more launches than we currently need to do for our satellite grid and scientific missions. When you are shipping in thousands of tons of precious metals a year, and shipping out thousands of tons of personnel and equipment, they suddenly get a lot more attractive, and I would say you could get launch costs all the way out to the belt for a million bucks a ton, and shipping home is a lot cheaper, no gravity or air to fight on the way back. If we spotted a hundred tons of gold just sitting on the moon, it would not be worth the money right now to go get that, it is only worth about four billion bucks. But if it were a thousand tons, forty billion dollars worth, then it probably would be since getting that home would not take nearly as much fuel per ton as getting the equipment there. The question then becomes, in terms of asteroids, can they dig out and process more of the material per year than the cost of getting them there? And if the answer is yes, then it is definitely a go. And while science fiction loves to show the poor asteroid miner, abused by governments or companies back home, with ample historical precedent to be sure, keep in mind that if they are only getting to keep just 1% of what they mined as compensation, they would be millionaires many times over again, so history is probably not a great guide to this. So I could easily see shipping home at a profit anything you could expect to get more than a hundred thousand bucks a ton for, which not only widens the market to include stuff like silver and germanium, but also means the market for gold and platinum and such can take a huge dive, down to just a percent or two of its current value, before it would not be profitable to mine. So while hauling home one huge million ton gold asteroid would probably crash the market for it worse than when aluminum became cheap a century back, asteroid mining would probably be an industry that could scale up a lot, with production costs dropping as we got more people out there and developed our infrastructure and experience. Whether or not we can do this profitably now or in the near future is certainly up for debate, and it might be we could discover tricks for mining on Earth that were just cheaper, and Earth's crust alone is a good deal more massive than the entire asteroid belt, albeit it probably does not have as much of some things as the asteroids do and that would probably be fairly destructive mining. But the indicators are good for this option as a way of getting us into space in a big way, and much better than Mars to be honest, in virtually every way. I do not think asteroid mining is going to become the new boom industry of the next couple of decades, but I do think we might well go that route in the not too distant future, and while I think over enthusiasm for asteroid mining certainly exists, I think dismissal of it as an option is even less grounded in reality. Naysaying is not the same thing as healthy skepticism, though some folks confuse it for just that. In the long term though, there is so much construction material out in the asteroids, and so conveniently distributed, that it is perfect for the construction of large numbers of rotating habitats or other megastructures we have discussed on the channel, and the asteroid belt is well suited to serve as the beginning of a modest Dyson Sphere or Dyson Swarm, something we have talked about a lot on this channel too. These sorts of habitats could house literally quadrillions of people just by hollowing out asteroids and reshaping them into rotating habitats, and they do not have the heat bottleneck we discussed in the video on Eucomonopolises. Now let us briefly mention the legal end of things. A common point brought up about asteroid mining, or mining the moon, is that it is arguably banned by treaty, and currently anything you do up in space requires you to be represented by a nation. The United States did legalize asteroid mining in 2015, and the UN treaty on the matter is fairly irrelevant anyway. All the big powers are very pro-space development, and I cannot think of any nation that is opposed to it either. Not that there would not be legal battles, but I would not expect them to interfere much. We have got centuries of precedence for mining here on Earth to deal with people trying to exhort ridiculous claims on stakes, and doubtless things like that will be tried in space too. Laws can be changed, and our current or recent ones on this have always been more of a placeholder than intended to be permanent. As a rule, legal bodies and legislatures generally prefer a wait and see approach with at most loose guidelines which is a generally good attitude on such things. 
That said, there is more to that, especially when we get into things like heritage sites on the moon. For instance, if someone decided they wanted to mine the Apollo landing sites, that would obviously be a big issue. Those are considered historical treasures by all of humanity, not just the US, just like the pyramids or Stonehenge for instance. If you want more information on that, it was a subject on the first episode of Spark Vsla's podcast, Monday Moon Days, that just came out last week. He's a longtime member of this channel's audience, and he discussed the notion of doing a Monday Moon Days with me a while back, and I was quite impressed with episode 1. Good, detailed discussion of the subject, and what appears to be a promising podcast, keeping up on developments with space exploration. I always get a bit of a kick plugging and promoting any of the creative works that this channel influenced, and again I was impressed, so I am including a link to him over at SoundCloud down in the video description. And I hope some of you will go there and give it a listen. And maybe some of you will likewise consider trying your hand at podcasts, art, or even videos on these subjects, and please let me know if you do. You can also find me over on SoundCloud where these episodes and some exclusive material can be found to listen to or download, and you can find all the videos on YouTube or at my website IsaacArthur.net. That will finish us out for this week. Hopefully you have a clearer idea what asteroid mining is all about. For my part, I'm quite optimistic, in a cautious way, about it being a path forward for major development of space. As mentioned, next week's episode is going to be on post-scarcity civilizations, and we will dig into the concept of what that is, if it is even possible, and what speculations folks have had about what that sort of society might be like in terms of both positive and negative aspects. That's next week, and the week after that we will take a deeper look at the notion of a technological singularity. To get alerts when those and other videos come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed this video and share it with others. Questions and comments are always welcome. The channel has been growing considerably of late, but I still manage to reply to most comments. I certainly read them all, and hopefully someone else will reply if I don't get a chance to. So next week, post-scarcity civilizations. Until then, thanks for watching and have a great day.